the Roman Empire, and I'm sure it's not news to you who are listening and viewing this podcast, fell. In fact, it fell in the year 476. Ah, uh, Rome had already been sacked in the year 410. Rome was weakened. There were Germanic tribes that were helping patrol their borders on the north. And Rome had really entered into a period of political and military decline. And what takes place in the 5th century is that there are a number of skirmishes between the Romans and the Germanic tribes who had first been seen as their allies and patrolled the northern frontier. In 476, these Germanic tribes invade the Roman Empire and split it amongst themselves. These Germanic tribes felt that there was no reason to keep up the pretense of what Rome was, because rather they represented the true energy and force behind the empire. And so the Roman Empire was split amongst a variety of these Germanic tribes. And for our purposes, the Iberian Peninsula was now taken over by the Visigoths. The Gothic tribes, the Western Gothic tribes, which is a translation of the term Visigoths. These Visigoths took over the peninsula and from all evidence seem to have ruled the peninsula with a very light hand. We do know that they decide to adopt Roman law and Roman legislation. We do know that the Visigoths were Christian. Ah, uh, they weren't Catholics like some of their Iberian brethren. Rather, they adopted a form of Christianity known as Arianism. Arian Christianity focused within the Trinity not on the divinity, but mostly on the humanity of Jesus. Ah, Jews lived comfortably, it seems, under the Visigoths. The Visigoths did not seem to notice that the Jews were any that much different than the other members of the population. They were happy to take over the Roman legislation and even some of the Roman laws which affected the Jews. In the year 586, though, the Visigothic Arians were now ruled by a king whose name was Recared. With the conversion of the Visigothic king Recared from Arianism to Catholicism, we start noticing in the legislation of that period that the Jews are beginning to be discriminated against. We don't know why, but we watch as we move from law to law, wondering why is it that the Visigoths have now begun to see the Jews in a new light. In fact, when it comes to the year 612, we truly are astounded. Then, the King Sisabut ascends to the Visigothic throne, and in the year following his ascension to the throne, in the year 613, issues an edict which probably shocked his contemporaries as it has shocked those of us who follow the history of the Visigothic period. In 613, King Sisabut declares that all Jews are to be forcibly converted to Christianity. Much speculation abounds as to why Sisabut came to this very stark decision. But I must tell you, there are no good reasons given. Economically, it did not seem to advantage the kingdom. Religiously, the Catholic Church had taught that forced conversion was simply forbidden. Politically, it did not seem to make sense to forcibly convert an element of the kingdom, a population which seemed to be well integrated into their surroundings. Be that as it may, the Jews clearly were now officially Christian. Maybe officially, but under the next king, King Swinthilla, the Jews who were forcibly converted were slowly allowed to return to Judaism. Those of us who are, going, who are embarking on this six-part podcast series will immediately take note that this is going to be the first of three times within the history of the Jews in this peninsula where we're going to witness a forced conversion. Here for the first time, forced conversion on the Sisabat 
and the relaxation of those laws under Swinthilla. After Swinthilla, King Sisanand ascended the throne in the 630s. So in the year 631, when Sisanand ascends to the throne, there is much tumult within the kingdom about what to do with the Jews who were forcibly converted and then allowed to return. The great churchman and church father, Isidore of Seville, realized that although he himself was against forced conversion, his teacher, the great Pope Gregory I, was so clear about it that it was against Christian law. It was against morality to force Jews to take upon themselves a faith which they didn't believe of their own free will. Israel of Seville nevertheless was concerned. What he was concerned about was, yes, the forced conversion was illegal, but these individuals were baptized. And they joined the church. And they took Holy Communion. And they ingested the body and blood of Christ. They were born again with a new spirit. And for Isidore of Seville, how could you let those individuals who were now saved return in those immortal words taken from the Bible to the vomit of their former superstition? And Isidore of Seville, at the Fourth Church Council of Toledo, in conjunction with King Sisanand, ruled that although the forced conversion was illegal, those Jews who had been forcibly converted would not be allowed to return to Judaism. From the Jewish perspective, this was quite difficult. Some Jews had already returned. Some remained converted. The government was not strong enough to enforce the rule that the next generation of children born to Jewish parents would be baptized as well. So it began to emerge within the Visigothic kingdom where Jews who were officially Christian and may have also attempted to become part of Christian society, but just as well there were Jews who were officially Christian who truly wanted to return to their Judaism and raise their children as Jews. A couple of decades later, this was going to create a great social problem in the Visigothic kingdom. One of the greatest of Visigothic kings ascends to the throne in the 650s. His name was Recaswinth, and he's troubled by the religious and social difficulties caused by Jewish population, some of whom have converted and others who have not. Recaswinth decides upon a novel policy. What Recaswinth is going to do is have those Jews who have, were forcibly converted and joined the Christian church sign an oath of abjuration where they promise from now on to be good Christians. In those days it was called a plakitum an oath of abjuration. We have the placitum that Recaswinth wanted the Jews to sign. And as you can imagine, I'm going to read it to you. To our most clement and most serene, Lord Recaswinth the King, from all of us, the Jews of the city of Toledo, the reader and the listener must already be shocked. The Jews of the city of Toledo, I thought all the Jews were forcibly converted under King Sisabut. I thought Isidore of Seville had declared that you couldn't return to Judaism. Ah, maybe they were practicing Judaism, but in the minds of the king, they were still considered Jews. Conversion did not ultimately change their official identity. And now, the oath of abjuration continues. We remember that we were formally obliged, well and justly, to sign an oath to observe the Catholic faith, and we've done so. But because the perfidy of our obstinacy and the inveteracy of our ancestral deviation detained us to such an extent that we do not truly believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. What these Jews are saying is, fascinatingly, the perfidy of our obstinacy 
We're stiff-necked people. What else are they saying? The inveteracy of our ancestral deviation. We were born Jews. This is indeed quite striking. Baptism is supposed to create in an individual a rebirth. And yet what are these Jews claiming? And what is the government claiming? That their characterological stiff-neckedness is still with them. That the fact of their Jewish parentage is still influencing them not to believe wholly in Jesus Christ. So now they take an oath with our wives and sons that we will not take part in any Jewish observance or in any Jewish custom. We shall not associate with non-baptized Jews. Fascinatingly, there are not only Jews, but there are non-baptized Jews. Let's get this straight. So there are Jews who have been baptized, and what are they called? Jews. And then there are Jews who have not been baptized, and what are they called? Jews. There are baptized Jews and non-baptized Jews, as opposed to Christians and Jews. And they promise not to associate with non-baptized Jews, which means what were these Jews who converted doing? Who were associating with their Jews, their friends, their family. They promise not to enter into any marriage with partners of our origin. We'll not celebrate Passover, Sabbath, and other holidays. We'll not discriminate in matters of food. These baptized Jews are promising not to marry within their own faith, not to celebrate Sabbath and Passover, not to keep kosher. What we need to imagine is that these Visigothic Jews who've been converted and were baptized were observing Judaism. We shall no do nothing of all that the usage abominable custom and way, life of, way of life of the Jews comprises. But what shall we do if we don't observe Judaism? We shall believe, confess, and venerate Christ, the Son of the living God. We shall hold and sincerely embrace all the usages of the holy Christian religion without any reservation of an opposition or falsity. What they're promising to do now is to observe Christianity, but to do it sincerely. I'd like to read just one more line from this lengthy oath of abjuration. Quite striking. So far, they've promised not to observe Judaism, but to follow Christian rules. Do you remember that part of observing Judaism that they're not allowed to do is that they won't discriminate anymore in matters of food? And now back to Rekeswinth's Placitum. Concerning pork, we promise to observe this, that if we could not possibly take it according to custom, at least we shall take the food cooked with pork without loathing and horror. This simple statement speaks volumes. Here the baptized Jews, on the penalty of death, have promised not to observe Judaism and to observe Christianity. Yet, what do they add? They add to the king. And the sword of the king is ha hanging over them that they cannot eat pork, no matter how hard they try. And Rekeswith, interestingly, permits them to. But what they do promise to do is that at least they won't refuse the foods cooked with pork. So here we are in the 650s on the King Grecoswinth, 40 years after the forced baptism, that we find Jews who have been forcibly converted, even under penalty of death, still being able to declare to the monarch that while they'll try to be good Christians and not observe Judaism, the eating of pork still fills them with loathing and horror. A window into 7th century forced converts quite striking from the plucky tomb of King Rekeswinth. If you can imagine, things only got worse from this point. Subsequent monarchs even came down more heavily on Jews who weren't baptized and those who were, trying to force conformity. By the 690s, the king of the Visigoths even attempts to force the Jews from the 
arrangement that they made with King Rekeswinth. King Ekiga declares that any Jewish businessman who wishes to continue to sign contracts and to engage in his commercial endeavors would have to seal every business deal with a recitation of the Lord's Prayer and a dish of pork. Ah, what the king is deciding in the last decade of the 7th century that there's no room for any compromise. It's hard for us, though, to imagine how the Visigothic government or the royal government itself was going to enforce such a law. Were they simply going to traipse after every Jewish business person and attempt to make sure that when they signed the contract they would recite the Lord's Prayer and eat a dish of pork? If I may say so humorously, do we imagine Jewish businessmen and businesswomen even going off hoping for a great day at the office with their lunch pail packed with the Lord's Prayer pasted to the inside of their lunchbox with the appropriate pork foods within so they, in case they would sign some contracts, would be able to follow the law of the land. What this law does indicate, and the flailing of the Visigoths towards the Jews, that there was a greater problem in the Visigothic kingdom, and indeed there was. The Visigoths and the Visigoth monarchy were beginning to lose hold over their entire population, and they were particularly concerned because there now were enemies that were knocking on the door, if you will, from the Iberian Peninsula. Oh, not from the north where they had come when they were the guardians of the Roman Empire. No, but they were knocking on the peninsula from across the way. If you look back at our map, you'll see that the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula is not far from the northern coast of Africa. And it's precisely at this point in the late 7th and in the early 8th century that people are beginning to gather a new force, a new power that has come all the way from the Middle East, in fact, from the Arabian Peninsula. The Muslims have begun to extend their empire. And in the second decade of the 8th century, they are poised at the tip of North Africa threatening the Iberian Peninsula. What will happen? What will happen to the Visigoths? What will be the future of the Jews within the peninsula? Will the Muslims be successful? Stay tuned.